Alrighty, folks, you're about to listen to a bonus huddle, a specially curated huddle that we run once a month with experts sharing their insights into the topics that are most important to our huddlers. The expert at this particular huddle was career coach Pat Rombaletti. She joined us to share how B2B CMOs can bulletproof their careers. Okay, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to our first bonus huddle of 2023. Our special guest today is Patricia Rombaletti, who I will be calling Pat in a second, um, an accomplished author, career coach, and marketing expert with over 20 years of experience in the industry. Her latest book, uh, Bulletproof Your Career, Navigating the Changing Landscape of Marketing Leadership, is a comprehensive guide for marketing professionals looking to build a strong, resilient career despite the ever-evolving business environment. We're going to split the conversation between steps you can take while you have a job to bulletproof your career and items to be thinking about if you happen to be in transition. But I really want the focus to be on the careers right now. So with that, let's welcome Pat Romoletti. Hello, Pat. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am awesome. Now, just to ground the conversation in Zoom land, where are you? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, one of seven cities that I've lived in, but that's where I am now. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get into it. In the second chapter of your book, which is Clarity is Power, can you talk about that, what that means in the context of being a CMO right now? Just on that context, being a CMO, this is my experience in my coaching and and et cetera, is that it's very clear when you're a CMO that you need to know the voice of the customer, who's the outside customer, who you're marketing to, et cetera. Um, I, I want to be sure that the same clarity of, of voice of internal customer is as well listened to, because I think that's where people more trip up. They know exactly what their own customers want, but there's a disconnect with the CMO or other stakeholders, right? Um, so my mantra always is figure out whoever you're talking to, figure out what matters to them and communicate in a way that they can hear that you know what matters. So for me, it's it's you have to have clarity about every stakeholder and what matters to them today. And you were talking earlier about the changing landscape, constant disruption, constant disruption. So what mattered to them today? Let's just take third quarter versus fourth quarter of 22. There are a lot of different things mattering to people and leadership in, in fourth quarter than third quarter. And as a CMO, you need to be you need to be that nimble inside and outside of the company, if that makes sense. And that's just in that role. There's a lot of clarity you need in your career. We'll get into that later. It's interesting. And it, it's it's tricky because with a brand, when we talk about brands, we talk about the inc- incredible importance of consistency, right? And I don't think we're you're saying you got to flip flop and you've got to be no. somebody different to each of these people, but you just have to understand how you're communicating to these individuals and, and reflects what, what's important to the business in the moment. And you don't flip flop and, and your style is the same, but what you have to be communicating is I understand what's important to you. And this is how I'm going to deliver what's important to you. Right. And making sure that that's that they feel understood and it's very clear. And also because of the disruption, the comment to some of the stakeholders of uh, somebody in sales, somebody in revenue. I understand how things have shifted for you and we're going to be a partner and shift along with you as best we can. But we do have a brand to to uphold. We have this. So, so making sure it's a two way street. But I just think there's no mistake when you take the time before you go into a meeting, before you present, et cetera, to say, what matters to that person on January 20th, 23? Right. It's leading with empathy. And it's funny, we had a lot of conversations and huddles. We talk a lot about taking the time with your direct reports to listen and be empathetic and say, how is everything in the world? But we haven't really necessarily talked and we haven't spent much time, but we're going to do that later in the year, about managing sideways and managing up and also thinking about what are their problems other than it's you know sales always has sales issues but really thinking in the context of today uh so okay that's helpful so empathy everywhere and preparing or trying to anticipate that will help okay for sure so 
Let's take this idea of clarity a step further. How important in your mind is it for CMOs to establish themselves as thought leaders, either in their industry or in the sort of world of marketing? Critical. I mean, just critical, critical, critical. And you all have a free platform, virtually free, which is to start with, which is LinkedIn. But again, I think this is, and many on this call will probably relate to this. When I coach people, they tell me so much this is true. You're sort of like the shoemaker and the children have no shoes, right? You're knee deep in branding, but you're not thinking about your own brand. Um, or you've defined your brand, but you haven't amplified your brand right? So you haven't taken it anywhere. So LinkedIn is the first place to start because it's free. It's your own little web page, and there's so much you can do in terms of posting. And yes, you may be in a position where you have to post things that are very tied to the brand that you're managing, that you're leading, but you can still do that in a way that you shine, right? But I think thought leadership is one of the misleveraged or underleveraged, fairly reasonably inexpensive tool that everybody has. Everybody has. And if you're not following thought leaders, if you're not thinking yourself as a thought leader, I would love to change your mind on that because I think it's so important for positioning. And by the way, it's important for positioning in the industry or in, this, in, the, in the lane that you're in now. But if you have aspirations to a different lane, then you need to be following thought leaders there, connecting with thought leaders there, and thinking about how you segue. So if you say, well, there's a natural segue from here to here, then demonstrate that by, you know, attending present trade shows and things in that industry and then saying, what's the buzz here and how can I volunteer to be on that panel next year and be sharing my thoughts? So it's really important for positioning. Um, I have an onboarding program that I do with clients. It's a 12 month program. And the, the last six months are really all on brand amplification. And this is an interesting one because over the years, and I, I think if, if I were to poll the CMOs in the audience, many of them would know there are some CMOs who've done an amazing job building their own brand, frankly, ahead of their company brand and, and are kind of legendary for it. I wonder if we, how that balance is done. And you talked a little bit about you saying, it's you can promote the company while you're sort of getting a little bit of yourself in there. I wonder if you can be more specific because that's a fine line. Totally. And I would say you actually put a little smudge on yourself when you're the star and it's clear that the company isn't. That's much more negative than positive, right? You're only defeating yourself. So for example, when I'm working with someone in the automotive um, data and analytics automotive industry, so she's going to post a lot of things about the automotive industry that coincide with her customers and how her customers use data. Well, but she's in a data company and she's demonstrating very nicely that she's on top of this. This is something you need to be on top of daily, weekly, monthly, right? So she's demonstrating that and she what she gets is from the company is great job posting things that are educating our customer, et cetera. She and I and a couple others, we have sort of a sequence where companies commercial real estate is great for this. They'll give their people in marketing a thousand pieces to post all the time. And then it's just like, oh, now you're just the mouthpiece of the company on your own brand. That's bad, right? But what we do is sprinkle those in, sprinkle in the more, the broader pieces than non-company PR with industry PR and thought leader PR and, and inside of that. And it creates a, a much better balance because you don't want to be the loud piece, the speaker for just yourself or just the company um, because you're part of an industry and a movement. And by the way, also articles about leadership because you're a CMO, you're a company that is recruiting. And if the company says, why are we posting leadership articles? We want new recruits to know that we have good leaders here. We know what a good leader looks like. Okay, they'll buy that most of the time. So there's a couple of things that... Uh, so. Clearly, you need to understand what your personal brand is, oh and you need to have a point of view in the marketplace, and you use that point of view to share content from the company. One of uh, uh, members of the audience, one, you, can you give a ratio of sort of company versus self? Is there a balance there? Is it a strict 50-50 split? No, I think that depends upon the point of view of your company. Right. So some companies pay more attention. Some companies are more like, why are we posting anything that's not all about us? And be prepared to say, well, then we just look like a commercial for them. And it's like that. That's not going to work. That's not what social media. 
people now are more savvy than that. That's not going to work. So you have to educate them. And is it a 50-50? No. Is it, you know, you have a new product release, you have a new acquisition, then you're going to heavily slate it a little bit more to the company. So, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about trying to get it split even. It might be 60-40 one time, 40-60 another, right? It's actually planning out. So with my clients, we have their content planned out, company, industry, leadership, and then their own point of view on, on topics, et cetera, right? So um, I think that, so for example, in an organization that is very high on hybrid, like they, they talk about it, I should be posting things about the benefit of hybrid and how great it is to work in a hybrid. That's going to help because everybody needs help with recruiting and retention. And that's consistent with the brand of the company because now when you're all in office, hybrid or virtual, that's part of your brand as a company now. It's certainly part of your employer brand, right? So that's a good idea. That might not be a topic that you think, what does that got to do with the brand? Everything. I heard a couple of things. I'm just going to restate. One is you're not a shell for your company. Right. You are a value-added thinker in your industry. So when you're sharing stuff, you're sharing stuff that's important to you as an individual, important to the company. One thing I have noticed is that many CMOs in the huddles are very effective at being cheerleaders for other departments and other employees that you know either have arrived or got an award and they're really good and, and do that. And that feels like really safe territory. I think that's good. It's relationship building, right? Because what matters to them? You're giving them, you're marketing the other people inside the company. So yeah, I, I think that's good. And it's also good to you know, you maybe didn't get on the dais and maybe somebody in your company didn't get the nice award that's going to go on some mantelpiece or desk, but somebody else did. So so sort of showcasing the achievement in the space is another safe place to go, right? But you're right. You don't want to look like a shill for yourself or the company. So, and I, I'm sort of going back to something that you said earlier, but I just, again, I wanted to put a punctuation point on it. So, if you have aspirations, for example, to change industries, then I, I appreciate how you're saying that, you know, reaching out and engaging with those folks. But it also could be that you want to be on a board, right? Oh, and no. so there's an opportunity there to think about your thought leadership and how the role of the CMO in that capacity. Okay. Totally. So, so just on that point, just for a quick second. So like, you know, I've worked with folks, for example, posting, what does the CEO what does the board want from the CEO? What does the board want from marketing? Like those are really good articles to post if you have aspirations to a board level position saying, I'm following the, the, the buzz out there about what's important to boards today. Right. Yeah. Okay. At the risk of generalizing, uh, you know, I, like you, I engage with a lot of CMOs and they tend to be an optimistic bunch which can be really hard when their budgets are being cut, which is about, I'm going to guess, 75% of the huddler community, but their goals aren't being cut. I mean, it's like you lost 20% of your budget, but keep growing that business 20%, knock yourself out. And you have a topic called master your mindset. And I, I'm just wondering if you can sort of help that because they're in an even more impossible place right now than they had, were a year ago. <laughs> yeah. It, listen, again, I, I coach people from all disciplines, right? So CIOs and finance, you, you name it. And every one of them, especially third quarter, when everybody was trying to stack their, their bonus up and make sure that the numbers worked out so they'd get it, lots and lots of cuts. I have a, a person in pharmaceutical and having to send half of their work overseas now because of the cuts. So it's very common. One of my biggest um, soapboxes is about mindset. And the most important thing is realize that I borrowed this from somebody so many years ago, I can't remember who it is. So I'll, I'll say it's not my original, but I don't know who it is, which is when you're inside your head, you're behind enemy lines. That's where all the bad talk goes. That's where you're beating yourself up. And that's what mindset's about. And when I talk about mindset in my, uh, you know, my Zoom calls and all the workshops that I do, it's about you have to master your mindset every single day. It's not like, oh, everything's good, so I don't worry about my mindset. I, my, in my coaching program, people have to rate their mindset on a scale of one to 10, and then they have to decide where am I? They're coached to try to stay between a seven and an eight minimum, right? Which means, well, if I'm not a seven or eight, 
then I need to listen to a podcast that bo boosts me up. You have to feed yourself as if you're trying to indoctrinate yourself because you are, right? So you're not gonna, and then the biggest thing about what you just described, which is cutting the budget, is if you think of a solid circle, red circle, my favorite color, red circle, with a little sliver, like maybe like a 1% sliver, the red circle represents things out of your control. The 1% sliver, what's in your control. And most mindset issues come from trying to change what's out of your control. So, yep, like, like with my client who I have to outsource. Yep, I said, now what you have to worry about is managing the people who are left behind who are afraid that they're next. So there's all kinds of other things that you have to go through. But it's really, it really is saying I'm responsible for brainwashing myself every single day. Brene Brown is one of my most... Um, favorite people to tell people, you know, to listen to. Um, and, and you know, male and female clients alike seem to just love her. She's just emblazons and emboldens you. But I think the biggest mistake about mindset is, is thinking it's a one and done. It's not like you check your oil every 5,000 miles. It's every day. Yeah. I feel like we need to do the power pose now. Totally. Uh, totally. I, what this reminds me of is, because uh, I remember I've occasionally will fall into the uh, I really need to get pumped up. And one of the things they talk about in those is how you start your day. Like a lot of folks get up in the morning and I know I'm in this habit right now and it's really a rut. First thing you do is check your email. Yeah. That's a negative moment mm -hmm. because you just, all you said, is, oh my God, look at all the emails I got well, overnight. Whereas certain folks that really manage their mindset are, they're listening to something inspirational. Totally. The first thing, right? Yep. And it's so how you use that first half an hour can even be a way of mastering the mindset. Yeah. Okay. And, Go and ahead. Just I'll, a half hour, hour, 15 minutes, just have a sacred moment for whatever you want to do. I watch a every single day since I discovered it whenever it came out, which was years ago, a six minute and 12 second video. And it's gorgeous. Um, It's called a gratitude video, but there's one line in it that gets me started every single day. And it says, Live today, all, all this other lead up to it, but so live today as if it's your first day and if it's your last day. And I'm going to tell you that when somebody, you know, steps on your toes or beats you up or whatever, you go, if this is my last day. I don't really give a damn what you just, right? And if it's my first day, I got my whole life ahead of me. Get out of my way. So that is simple. Six, eight minutes or six minutes and, and 12 seconds, maybe. And then you're off to the races. So if I don't have an hour, I always have that. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Now this other chapter, create a network that works, obviously brought a lot of joy to my heart. Let's talk about the timing of building your network. Cause this is the, we get a lot of inquiries from at CMO models for folks when they're in transition, as opposed to while they're working. Can we talk about why it's so important to do this while you have a job? We didn't talk about it until about midnight, three weeks from now, I have enough content for that. But to give you the Cliff Notes version, it is essential. So listen, when you are in a role and you say, I, so anybody in my onboarding program in their role, we make sure that they're safe and sound and assimilated, but guess what we're doing? We've got a target list of where do I want to go next? And when you're already employed and you reach out to people in that company or people who know people in the company, they will accept your invitation. It's like, oh, they're not they're not going to send me their resume now or hit me up for a job. And you reach out and say, you know, we have a lot in common. I use affinity points, like reach out to somebody in a target company that went to your college, that's in your industry, right? So all of that. But you have the entree is much easier when you're, when you're in, uh, not in transition. Um, when you're in transition, a lot of people are afraid. They, they're not afraid to help you. And I want to make this distinction. People think, they don't want to help me. No, they're afraid they can't help you. And when somebody's afraid they can't help you, do you ever have somebody come up and they're begging for money and you don't have a, even a nickel in your pocket and you don't even want to look at them, you want to walk away? That's the same sensation. They don't know if they can make an introduction. They don't know how to help you, so they would rather avoid you, right? So it's, it's a matter of you curate your network continuously and you cultivate the network continuously and especially curating if you're in a job, so the most painful for me is when somebody comes, they're in transition and they say, I've always wanted to change industries and this is the year. And I have to tell them that when you are in transition, you have so much less power. You're 10X less powerful, 20X less powerful the day after than the day before. 
And so changing industries, why is that so bad? Not that you couldn't bring a fresh eye. And for sure, as a recruiter, I loved that people could do that, but my clients didn't because they see it as a risk. And we are in the probably one of the biggest risk averse times that we've ever been in. So they look and go, really great background, but what if you can't adjust to our industry, right? But if you have a network in that industry, so you say, next industry, I want to be there. And you build that network while you're already in a role. Now you've got what I call the tip of the spear already established and somebody to speak up for you and say, I know, you know, she doesn't have our industry experience. He hasn't done that, but I've gotten to know him. You should talk to him. And that goes a long, long way. I definitely have had clients or people from my Zoom calls who have been able to change industries, but only because they built the conduit into that industry before they lost their role. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. So... There used to be these things called physical events <laughs> and trade, and they're coming back. I'm joking, but, and I used to meet a lot of CMOs at these events and like many folks that go to the events, even though I am an extrovert, you get to those events and it's intimidating. Can you look around, you see if you know anybody, you don't know anybody and you sort of go to the bar, get a drink and figure out what to do. I loved in the book, you had a couple of ideas, quick thoughts on how to when you do go to an event again, how you can sort of make the most of those situations. It's predicated on the fact that I know for sure, and I, I coach in, from this perspective is more than 70%, at least 70% minimum are either full on introverts or ambiverts, right? So there's only about 20 or 30% in that room. And even myself as an extrovert, which you might figure out that I am, I don't love going and smoozing around at events, right? Smoozing is what everybody avoids. So one of the things is get there early because if you walk into a buzzing, noisy room, you think that that doesn't really have cover for you. It actually is intimidating. Like you're missing out on something. You're, that's what your brain goes. Oh, look, everybody's talking to somebody except me. So that's not a good way. So get there early is really important. Second thing is make sure that you, when you register at the desk, get your badge. That person who's handing out that badge most of the time is more than just the badge maker. They usually have some, they've registered people. They know something and say, look, I'm here from XYZ or I'm a CMO and I'm looking to meet ABC. Is there somebody who's already checked in that I should be on the lookout for? Can you direct me to that person? Now, guess what? You walk up to them and you say, John, I was talking to Susan at the registration desk and I told her a little bit about my background and she thought that it would be great if you and I meet. Get, guess what? You have total credibility right then. It's like, oh, you're not a stranger. Susan sent you over here, right? Breaks the ice for you. And then the last thing is leave when you need to leave. If you are an introvert, you are exhausted by the time they sit down and say, now we're ready to begin our program. And you're going, good Lord, I just want to be out of here. Leave. It's okay. You didn't, you know, you want to get your money's worth. You got it. You came in, you networked. I'm not saying you don't listen to the program if you, if you have the stamina for that, but if you, and let's, the other alternative, and I coach some of my clients like this, if you have the stamina to listen to the program because you really want to hear it and you want to take your notes, that's great. But you don't have to stay in and network afterwards. Like take care of yourself and leave with, leave at the point at which you're effective, not ineffective. Uh, a couple of what side notes, one for all the huddlers who do come to our the Forrester Conference in June, I promise to be there to introduce you to anybody else yeah. on the list. So yeah. I'll, I'll be the role of host there to help you through that. Secondly, one of the things that I love, because this is my habit, is you, you know the notion that you don't have to meet everybody. You can go deep. And really, that's... that's and, that's and it's funny, I'm, I'm looking at thinking one of the individuals on, on the call, I think... I met at another event a couple of years ago. We spent like 30 minutes talking, right? There were other people going, but the rule okay. of 250, Drew. It's a rule What's of that? 250. Um, it's an old rule. If you if you Google it, you'll see it. it has nothing to do with LinkedIn. Um, it was decided a long time ago from other just anecdotal research, but it basically says everybody you meet can introduce you to 250 people. So I always coach my introverts to say, look at look at this way. You're going to get tired out. That's the really the introvert isn't somebody who doesn't like people, you just don't, you, you tire easily and you don't like chit chat. You like to go deep. You like to, you have network in a very different way and it's not about schmoozing. So you'd rather have two deep conversations, but if you believe in the rule of 250, which I do, and especially now at LinkedIn, you actually know how to find those 250. 
you have two conversations and you have the doors open to you for 500 people. Think about it that way. So you had a really productive evening. You met two people. I, I, I have some clients that I say, if you're going to be at a 10, 10 seat tabletop, get to the meeting in time to sit down at the tabletop and really get to know the people at your table. Really focus on that. It's easier. It's not a, you know, it's a, a much easier conversation. I just really believe in making it, networking in a way that works for you is going to make it work every time. Okay. We share a common perspective on marketing and whether it's like your personal brand or your company's products that you always sort of need to be making deposits in the goodwill bank. And in my book, I call that selling through service and yours that plays a big role in the art of the outreach. Can you talk about and maybe give an example of a successful sort of deposit in the Goodwill Bank versus a failed one? And this is probably as relevant or more relevant to the folks in transition, but still talk a little bit about the mistakes that you see when people are doing this outreach and not really, you know, making a deposit. Right, <laughs> right. And that, and just so everyone understands the deposit is you pay it forward, then it pays you back, right? That's the Adam Grant theory. And I believe it. it, it has certainly worked for me. I'll give you an example. I had two people, had somebody call me and he said, I don't understand. I reached out to the CEO and I, you know, sent them a, an invitation to connect. I heard nothing from them and I sent this message. And then my colleague, somebody else that he knew, had reached out to the same CEO, answered right away. What did I do wrong? And I said, tell me about your message and tell me, do you know what, what her message was? And he said, yes. His message was, you know, basically, I'll paraphrase it. Hi, I'm Mike. I need a job. That's why I'm reaching out to you in a nice way. But that was the essence of it. Um, her message was, I've been following your company. You're having, you know, reaching out to the CEO. Let's see what matters to the CEO when we send the message. That's the mindset, right? Reaching out to you. I've been following your company. You have a tremendous results that you're achieving. I want to congratulate you. And if there's any way that myself or my network can help you with your continued success, please let me know. No request. No, I'd like to, you know, give me 10 minutes of your time. How many 24 hour, 10 minutes do we have? Let's think about this, right? It was nothing. And she got an immediate connection request back from that person. Thank you for your interest and attention and, you know, for, for following my company, right? That's what matters to the CEO. I'm on somebody's radar about something. And by the way, gee, you do have a good network and all. So it's, it takes patience and it takes, you know, if anybody has ever, um, maybe you sold a house and you got a big check and you deposit it in the bank and it's over a certain amount. The bank says, we'll be happy to take the check and it'll take seven to 10 days to clear and then your money will be available. In the meantime, we'll give you a few few pen, you know, pennies. You have to wait for the check to clear. The same thing is true. Not only do you make a deposit in the relationship, but you have to give it a chance to clear. And that takes ongoing nurturing and relationship. However, it works. Okay. Uh, and we've all gotten those LinkedIn requests that were exactly as you're described. Mm -hmm. And then we've also, you know, the good ones and, and the bad ones. So on the flip side, CMOs are a lot of, under a lot of pressure. Their inboxes are full with an amazing number of requests for their time, their help consider just on a company level. Then yeah. you get all these folks that are in transition that are using terms. Of, I'd love to pick your brain or I'd love to talk to you or buy you coffee. And it could be, it's overwhelming. How would you suggest that CMOs manage this? I mean, let's face it. There are a lot of folks in transition that need a lot of help right now. The most important thing to know is as much as you might say, I just don't have the time for that. That's the beginning of a relationship that could be the person that could make the introduction for you two or three years from now. And that's what people don't think about, right? So in other words, you see it as a bother or you know, again, I don't know how I can help you. You have to be very prescriptive when you respond. I'll tell you one of the things I do, you might imagine I get a lot of messages. I can't answer everyone for sure, but I try to answer as many as I can. And sometimes what I do is I pop onto Zoom. I record a quick message back. Hey, I got your message. I would love to talk with you. So somebody will say, can you introduce me to anybody at Citibank? Yes, I have 47 connections there. Let's get a little bit more specific. So I get instructional as a coach might do, right? So I send them a quick message and say, I need to know who you want to be introduced to. I need to know why you want to be introduced. I need some help from you. And then I'll be happy to help you. 
And as soon as you get back to me, I'll take care of it. So that's boom, it's off my table. I have an inbox zero method. It's gone, right? Now, in general, the most important thing though is what I started this discussion with. You're gonna get a message, this is so annoying, I just don't have time. Oh, wait a minute, this person, two years from now, a year from now, six months from now, could be someplace, believe me, that I need the introduction into, and now you've made that deposit. So it, it can be a hard decision to make, but it, when you're making that decision, you're choosing your career over something else in your inbox. And I'm not saying if you're, you have a deadline to deliver a presentation and the board wants numbers, you have to be use good discretion, but don't think of it as an annoyance. Think of it as an investment in your future. Right. So I'm going to add a couple of things onto that. So if it's an email, I have about 25 different standard signatures and the signatures actually include responses that mm -hmm. I pre-written. <clears throat> and by the way, I can take that same signature and put it into a Google doc. So if someone does request the time, you can say, I'd love to talk to you and you already have it written. Can you be more specific on how I can help you yep. or have a request specifically? Mm -hmm. And then that puts the onus back on them to take an action right. to try to do something. If you have these standardized responses and you can, it saves so much time And signatures are, are godsend. And I don't think folks employ those enough or just a long Google doc. Okay. Uh, just one thing on that. If anybody hasn't used or heard of Text Expander, you can put anything in the, you can put a three page document into Text Expander and you stroke three keys or two keys or however many you decide how many you set it up, but it's somewhere between one and three keys and it will spit out anything and everything. So anything that I type more than twice becomes a text expander. And I now have hundreds of them in there. And you can use it inside of LinkedIn. Any place where you write a message, is, they have it for Microsoft and Word. That's the same thing. Microsoft and Mac, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and it's 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 a godsend. I mean, you can put cool addresses, everything. So can't wait to try it. Yeah. Love that. So I've noticed, and this is, it's funny, a lot of CMOs who've been in their roles a long time don't tend to update their LinkedIn profiles. And so I'm just wondering, is this something that they should be doing? And if they do, what kinds of things should they be including? Yeah, great. So I've been teaching LinkedIn since 2005, and I started teaching it to lawyers and accountants. So that was a tough road to hoe, let me tell you, out in LA. Um, but let me explain to you, as a recruiter, I did recruiting for two decades. As a recruiter, I was harshest in judging marketing people's LinkedIn profiles versus if a CFO didn't have a great you know, profile, no big deal, right? If a marketing person didn't have a presence on Twitter, not so much these days, I don't care about that. I, I don't recruit now, but I wouldn't care about that so much these days, but didn't have a presence on Twitter and didn't have an updated LinkedIn profile, I, I would be judgmental about that in many ways. The things that you want to know is do not have stale recommendations. I look at profiles and you have people haven't had recommendations since 2014, 2016, 2003, right? Like have recently received at least now we're in 23, some recommendation from 22 and not just recommendations received, but given. I remember somebody, somebody referred me to somebody when I was a recruiter and they said, you know, she's really talented, but I will tell you, she seems a little narcissistic, but you know, you have a talk with her and I don't know what kind of a leader she would be. I look at her profile. She's got 40 re received. She hasn't given one recommendation. And then her thing says, you know, that she's a great leader and builder of her team. It's like, give them a recommendation. Why don't you? Right. <laughs> so recommendations are important. Your about section. I have a particular way of viewing that. It does not and should not, and you will be penalized by Amazon if it is full of keywords. You put your keywords down under your experience section, but your about section should be your story. We are in the era of storytelling. You tell stories about your brand. You tell stories about your product. You tell stories about your company. You should be telling stories about yourself. And so all of my clients' about sections are taken from the assignment that they do, and we create a story about what how can we prove that this background and this story makes you so good at who and what you do today, who you are and what you do today? So that's really important. And just keeping it fresh. I mean, posting at least once a week yourself or your own, especially if you're in transition, that the algorithms don't care about the, you. 
All the keywords in the world don't give you greater visibility on LinkedIn, period, end of story. They don't run their algorithms like Google. What gives you, key, gives you visibility on LinkedIn are two things, activity and connectivity. And why is that? You follow the money. The more activity you have, the more and the more connections you have with other people who are connectors, the more they can go to their advertisers and say, we have a very active community. 40% of our people sign on every day, 60% do this. And therefore, we're going to charge you this outrageous price to advertise on our platform. And everybody who's posting and getting engagement on the platform and connecting regularly is helping drive that algorithm and drive those statistics that they present to their advertisers. So I think people focus so much on keywords and not on it's like any, it's the age of social media, the age of digital is you got to have engagement and activity in order for that thing to pay off, right? Those are the most important thing. And then other than that, it's another subset of a whole science, but belonging to the right groups, groups from your industry, groups from your area of specialty, leadership groups, alumni groups, et cetera, and having that, that connectivity and actually engaging in them. Not every day. There's a, you can, you know, um, I, my clients, I say, pick three a week that you might go visit. You might not even have activity in, but just look at three of them a week. And if you have, you know, 12 in four weeks, you've been through all of your groups, you're done. So make it very systemized. We have to dwell on LinkedIn a little bit more. Uh, you covered a lot of things you talked about having your about story be a, sto a story, literally, that sort of tells the story of your career. And we talked about recommendations, both giving and getting them and having those updated. A little bit of keyword stuff, but being careful not to sort of get the Microsoft police or some of those others annoyed at you. I'm just wondering if there's anything in, in posting with regularity and groups, is there anything else that you see are common mistakes in in LinkedIn profiles, and this could be for you know currency modes or or ones that are transition. The biggest mistakes I see egregious is the constant loading because everybody tells you to load your keywords into your about. And and again, there are um, I can send you Drew when I send you that link, I'll send you some slides that I use that it's LinkedIn saying if you put too many keywords in, we're going to suppress your profile. How about that, right? Um, that's, that is one of the biggest and neglecting the, um, there really isn't when I think it through, it's, if you're posting things, making sure that it's the, the rule of thumb is if you could take it off of LinkedIn and easily apply it to Facebook, don't post it. Right. That's, that's a big rule of thumb. So when I see people like, look at this, it's like, no, 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 no. You, you signed into the wrong platform, go over there. Right. So realizing that it is a business platform, right. The other missed opportunity is that what I teach is when you post and people engage, so they say, I like it or I comment. So most people go on and they see that somebody commented and they'll thank them or they'll make a comment back. So there's some engagement there, but most people don't even do that. They post and go. But the real missed opportunity is even if I just liked it, every, I have want you to go back to your likes. You know, you posted, give it about a week, maybe 10 days, go back to your likes, see who liked it. Gold mines there. So some are going to be your friends who are helping you. And, and then you're going to say, oh, here's this first level connection that I've lost touch with. People always say, how do I reconnect with people? Wait till they reach out is, is part of it, right? So now you can reconnect with them. What I do when I go and look at mine is I scroll immediately down to the end, which is where my second and third level likers are going to be. So now somebody is a second level connection or a third level connection, and they liked that. I will use that as the opportunity with discretion. Like, oh, that's somebody that would be good to get in dialogue with. That's somebody to connect with. And I'll reach out to them and say, I'm really, thank you for liking my post. I'm glad you enjoyed my content. I'd love to connect with you because I post content like that all the time. And once we're connected, you'll have more visibility to it. And, and that's how I built have built my, partly how I started building my network up and up and up by re-engaging with those likes. It, all of you in marketing will cer certainly appreciate this. When I was in retained search, I specialized um, at what most of my career, I specialized in family owned, closely held businesses. So I posted an article about family owned business issue. And this person responded and he was a consultant for family owned businesses. I thought, how oh, great. So I reached out, gave him that. Thank you for liking that. And he and I said, Do you want to jump out on a 10 minute call? I'd like to find out more about your practice. We jumped on a 10 minute call. An hour and a half later, he had asked me to please write articles for three 
newsletters that he had going out. He had, this is a long time ago. So when I tell you this number, gosh, this could have been in 2009. I don't know. It's a long time ago. He had a hundred thousand subscribers on his newsletters. And he asked me to write three articles for the three different newsletters. And in advance, before I appeared as the writer, he sent out a pre-notice to his list of 100,000 saying, she's going to be on this, pay attention. And it's all family businesses. It was like, all I did was say, hey, thanks for liking my post. Let's have a 10 minute call. And that was the exposure I got. Wow. You never know who is on the other end of these things. But there were a couple, there was one little subtle thing. And I love the language that you used when you do the LinkedIn request because there was a give there. There was a deposit. Oh, we could help each always. other. And next time you have a thing and I comment because we're connected, it'll be more valuable for you. That always. was a key little insight. And I can't tell you how many connection requests I get where there's no notice at all. We're the ones I get that are saying, I noticed you. I'd yeah. like to connect. It's like, yeah, wow. or, or the LinkedIn said, we should be connected. Really? Oh. That's the best you can do. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, here's a question from the audience. Going back to your topic, finding a set of topics to share on LinkedIn and Twitter that support a consistent personal brand. What's the right ratio of sharing other people's posts or creating your own original posts? Yeah. So, and let me explain one of the things that's most important to understand is consistency. Posting once a week consistently is better than posting two or three times a week randomly, right? So given how busy everybody is, I shoot for consistency over originality. Because a long time ago, there was a wonderful quote that said, you know, people no longer care who wrote it. They just care that it's valuable to them, right? So, it, so I don't worry about whether I'm not writing original posts. I'm creating 10, 12 hours of content every week for my Zoom calls. I'm not doing that. But I will tell you, but if you have a real talent for writing or once a quarter, you want to put out something original, that's great. Don't aim for original at the con cost of consistent once a week, right? So, but if you could mix it in and you want to be known for a topic and you're a good writer and you, you know, you're, con when I say a good writer, that it comes easily to you so you don't agonize over it. That's great. Um, the, uh, uh, what is the right ratio sharing? Other people's posts. When I don't share a comment on others and I'll share it in my, I have a private LinkedIn group and sometimes I'll share posts in there. I probably do that. Gosh, that's, I don't, I don't, you can tell, I don't have a system or point of view about the, that being of great value. And it's very interesting because my brand is Bulletproof Your Career. I don't comment or share my own clients posts because I don't want their CEO going, who's this Bulletproof Your Career lady that's giving you all this advice? about how to get the hell out of here. So I, I don't do that, which is probably why I stumble because most of my things that are up are my own clients. I do have some people that I ask to share my clients things that won't cause that, expose the, that I'm behind them coaching, right? It's really understanding having consistency in the point of view, consistency in the brand messaging that you're sending and just once a week and not wearing quite as much about the ratio of the mix and more about the consistency because that's what's king. Love that. Agree with that. Your recommendations for jobs hunters, it, it just made me think of all the ABM conversations that we have, uh, you know, that B2B marketers are deploying. You call it a career blueprint. Can you talk about how the folks in between opportunities can put this career blueprint to use? So there's a couple of things about when I think of a blueprint, I think most people, especially when you start your career out, you you think of your blueprint is I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go from here to here, here to here, here to here. That worked until Jack Welch and, you know, the man who broke capitalism, if you haven't read that book, please do, sort of changed the rules. And now when I think of a career blueprint, it's it has to be a combination because we all know, and if you've heard my TED Talk, there's a story I tell in there and that gentleman who created a, something in, in the innovation group that brought billion dollars worth of revenue to the company. And then they said, we're shutting down your department. So what we now know is that the blueprint that says, oh, the blueprint used to be, I'll just do a really great job and I'll be good. The idea is now you want to have a blueprint for bulletproofing your career, which says, I'm going to do the best job I can do. I'm going to do a great job where I am. And I'm going to recognize that that doesn't guarantee anything. And so my blueprint is always having a plan A, plan B, and always knowing where would I go next? Who, what connections do I have there? Making sure that in your blueprint, you're tracking where's the industry going? What are the changes going on? Who are the up and comers? 
who's the competition that is, you know, eating my lunch? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I ought to have dinner with the CEO. It's really, really, really paying attention both inside and outside the company. And it's difficult. I'm not saying it isn't, but you have to have an A, B mentality in your blueprint for sure. My methodology is you, you start with clarity, you move to eliminate. So you eliminate anything around you that distracts you and from doing great in your job and taking care of your career. Then you prioritize yourself and then you accelerate your activities. So the blueprint is a little bit different and it needs that A, B path. Interesting. And I mean, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about, you know, there are over a hundred B2B CMOs in, in CMO huddles. And I'm wondering how can we help our community bulletproof their careers collectively? Just for example, we do help with the personal brand with our Tuesday tips and with the shows, but, and there's other things, but I'm wondering if we need to sort of accelerate some areas to help the whole community bulletproof themselves. I would say a couple of ways. First of all, I do a free Zoom call every Thursday. I've been doing it for four years. That's what you take. That's consistency, right? I started August 2nd, 2018. I'm still doing them. We have four or 500 people on that call, right? And one of the big, of that, we've had 2,995 people from that community land since we started. And all but 11 of them landed through networking. So the most important thing is to really cultivate and curate within the community and not feel them as comp competition, et cetera, make those introductions. But the other piece that we've been talking about a little bit here is the changing of industries and understanding what's going on and making sure that there's some sort of a conduit to be sharing. So if you're interested in getting into the pharmaceutical industry, but you're in a technology industry or vice versa, that you're really understanding that you each have such valuable information to share. So it's, it, there's so much about knowing where's the, you know, where's the puck going and helping each other with those pieces of information. It's just so critical in this day. And, and introductions, 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 introductions are so important. Um, I, so really it rotates around a more, a more strategic and systemized networking process. I really appreciate that because I'm thinking about, we have a contingent of say ed tech people who might want to get in health tech. We have a contingent of health tech and their employers probably don't see the connection at all. But if we were to bring those two together and, and let them talk about if they had aspirations to go from one to the other. Right. Okay. Right. Do you put, um, recommend you have open to work um, on your LinkedIn profile when you are in fact open to work? I, this is, I, I've full disclaimer, personal opinion, but I'm going to give you the reason behind it. As a recruiter, when I was recruiting, there wasn't that collar that they have now, but there was always some way that you could say, I'm looking, right? When I would present a candidate, especially at the executive level, but that's all I did was retain search. But when I would present a candidate to a client, if they saw too much like, hey, look at me, I'm looking for a job, I'm looking for a job, their immediate response to me was, they don't want this job, they want any job. It, it, it took it down a peg. It, and then I had to say, no, 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 no. You know, they're just, I had to go on and on and on. And so I got to the point, I learned quick that I would say, take all that down because they're going to they're gonna push back on me. Just let me know. And, and here's what I want you to understand. It doesn't buy you anything. I will tell you what it does because you're all marketers. What do you think it does for LinkedIn? It tags you. So you put that on, it creates a tag. They go to their advertisers and say, we can present to you everybody who has self-selected and said, I'm looking. And now you can sell them resumes and you can sell them coaching. You can sell them all this stuff. That's why they do it. They're not doing it for you. Follow the money. So it's not for you. It's for them. And it's kind of not that attractive, but the most important principle is to understand recruiters actually don't care if you're looking. Their job is to find the right person for the company and for the requirements. So their job is to call up and say, whether you're looking or not, you need to listen to me. I've got a great opportunity for you. Now at the lower levels, if I'm a, a phone jockey in a staffing company trying to find programmers or engineers for this or that, it helps me if I know that they're looking. But at the executive level, it doesn't help at all. I'm taking that as a full no. And, it build, and, and by the way, and it builds on an idea that I was talking to a good friend who is in fact in transition. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on it. it one of the reasons that it's so much easier to get a job <clears throat> when you have a job is that you're not available because you got a job. 
So how does someone who doesn't have a job create the notion of scarcity? At one point in my career, I actually lost four jobs in a two-year period. It was a really bad period in the marketing business. And one of the things I discovered was that every interview was a near job. Every, every offer would beget another offer. So I could create oh. scarcity by saying, well, I'm very close over here, but you're my preferred choice. These days, it's very hard. You can't fake that anymore. Yeah, you can no. pretend. How do you create scarcity? Um, it isn't the scarcity that's giving the employed person the advantage. So I wouldn't go with that. What's giving the employed person the advantage. So let's start there. What's giving them the advantage is that they perceive at any time somebody is unemployed, this, the fear goes in to say, well, I can understand. I mean, I, I have somebody who the company shut down and the CEO said, I don't know. I think they must have done something wrong. I go, you want me to go take a picture of the padlock? The company doesn't even exist anymore, right? But there's that that niggling of maybe, because uh, everybody's afraid to hire. So maybe I'm missing something. Maybe they really did mess up and I can't see that. So it's the fear factor that's the problem. But I can tell you that as a recruiter, there's nothing more aggravating than just to try to pit the, your opportunity against it. Now being straightforward and saying, I have, I'm very close in calls with somebody else and, and it has to be legit and it has to be an authentic. And you say, I can tell you, not just I would rather yours than that, but I have always been leaning towards your role and here's why. And give them specific reasons. You have this going on. Your next product launch is right in my eye. I have a playbook for your company. You have this, you have that. So tell them what the contrast is, but give them that, that advice. But I want you to understand that saying, oh, I'm, I'm so busy and everybody wants me and you should try to buy me faster. It doesn't really play well in the executive level. Right. I, I do think if it's been a while between opportunities, it may be time to hang up, the, put the shingle up and have a lot of sh sort of shared CMO part-time jobs so that, again, you're not just sitting out there and vulnerable as, oh, well, I don't know, I, we don't have to hurry on this individual. Right. But don't do it. So here's the thing. When I coach folks who have done some consulting, don't do it from the perspective of, I've hung out a shingle and I've become Pat Rombletti Incorporated because then let me tell you, again, this is an insider recruiter. My clients would say, oh, they don't really want a job. They just don't have any active clients. Their, their cash flow is low and their track of clientele is, is low. But once they get, if somebody comes to them for another you know, gig, they'll go back, right? So they, they were skeptical. Again, they're, they're looking for a reason not to hire you, not a reason to hire you. However, what we do is just put up, you know, not a name, just like a CMO consulting for retail or something like that. And then in the description, we say sought out based on expertise in XYZ area to consult on this. So now it's like, I wasn't looking, but I'm so well known. They came to me and asked me to help them. And that's what I'm doing. And that's the real nuance, but it makes a huge difference. Oh, no, I, I can totally see that. And uh, I, I get it. Okay, that's awesome. All right. So there's so many wonderful little tips in your book. Uh, and one of them that really struck me because I noticed in in one CMO is looking that their CV and the dates and the that didn't quite perfectly match the LinkedIn profile. And went, uh, a lot of folks are trying to get depressed by their digital submissions, which you just say, that's a black hole, yeah. avoid those. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't play that game. Don't play that game. You also have thoughts on building connections with recruiters, which were great. So I'm wondering if, again, for the CMOs who are looking for a new role and they, whether they have, they're employed now or they're in between opportunities, two do's and a don't for them to, uh, on, a, on a big picture level. When you're employed, by the way, and you're connecting to outside recruiters, and Drew, I'll be happy to share my two documents on that with you as well. And I have a, I have a, a specific way to outreach to recruiters and a strategy. And again, based on, let me tell you how that strategy works. So, so obviously recruiters are important. That's one. But the strategy works because you connect with recruiters that give, and that gives you huge visibility across the network. And my document explains that. But if you, especially if you're employed, you will get a higher, you just get a higher rate of acceptance with recruiters. That's number one. But I you still want you to connect with recruiters as a first step for anybody, even in transition and using my strategy. And it explains exactly why. So that's really important. The second thing is have a target list of companies. Know where you want to go to. Have a list that says, not just waiting for somebody to come, 
I always say, if you don't have a target list, you don't have a search. What you have is I'll wait and see. It's like the difference, you know, between somebody knocking on doors, selling something and somebody putting it in a retail. So I need you to have a target list. It, and you don't have to know a lot about the company other than it's the right size, it's the right industry, it's got the right product. So just generically, once you start to, to learn more about the company, you can decide whether it's going to be a good fit, but don't worry about that yet. It's sort of like if you're dating, just what's the right age, age, where do they live? What's this, that situation, right? So have that. And then really do what everybody puts off until the last, the, the last thing that they do, which is start reconnecting, start connecting. You've got to start making deposits in your network either way, right away. It has to happen. And when you've landed, you have to maintain those connections, not daily, not like you are when you're in, in transition. You can't let that bank account drift below and, and have an overdraft. That's all there is to it. Right. Again, we're going back to ABM. You have the 25 companies that you want to work for next, just in case. You could use the Navigator. Make that list as a, a prospect list, if you will. LinkedIn will automatically give you updates when they've posted something about it. And you can just engage with there. So again, if you're looking, that solves two, two things for you. How do I engage? In, and so add to that or, or tell me yeah. where I went wrong on that. No, just, no, it's perfect. But I just want to give an example because one of the biggest things when you have that target list, the way I teach my folks is, you don't create a list of targets first, actually. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you, you're going to have a target list, but the way we compile it, and I, and I have a case study because my client is flying back from Poland today and he starts his new job on Monday using this. The first thing we do is find an affinity point. An affinity point can be a company that you worked for prior. So in his case, we had, he had worked 18 years at a company and they had a lot of alum. So we looked at, at that company first. And the second um, a point is college. So in other words, here's how am I going to have a target of companies? This is exactly how we compiled his. He worked at this company. He lived in Dallas and he wanted to kind of stay there. And we did a search on people in Dallas in his industry, in the software, computer software industry, who used to work at his prior company. And we compiled a list of CEOs. And we also looked for just CEOs. We compiled the list of CEOs in that, in, in that criteria. And I think there were 27 or maybe even 50. I can't remember. He starts on Monday with a complete stranger who he reached out to, who was a CEO who worked at a company that he worked at. And he sent a, a connection request and a message and said, I see that we share alumni from this company. And based on your organization, I just thought it would be good for us to meet. No pressure. And it was, wh why does that work? Because companies, when companies hire somebody from another company, they know that, oh, that company's culture fits, the background fits. So they like that. So now you use that to reach out just as we did casually. And it turned out that at eight o'clock one Friday night, he got a call because they had a huge problem in their chief revenue officer. And that's what he's starting at. And that whole thing took less than 60 days, right? So Amazing. that's number one. And if you do, if you do your college, so when you're going to reach out, you graduated from, you graduated from where you are mostly in, let's say Stanford, um, New York, University of Michigan. Maybe the Bulldogs, since we, we've got this great Bulldog team down here. So you graduate from Georgia, you're in my industry, and you're in marketing. We have three things in common, right? So now you're reaching out with three affinity points. And you think that doesn't matter. It does. You think about yourself. I reach out to you, Elms College. What's that? Matt, Atlanta, don't want anybody there. No big deal. But now I say, hey, we're both, we're all Bulldogs, graduate. And maybe you say, I see we have some common connections, but the other affinity points, I had a client here and I was doing some research on something else and I sent her a note and I said, bullseye, I found somebody for you, five affinity points based on your background, reach out to that person. Here's his link. She reached out to him. She called back the next day. She said, we have a conversation at the end of this week. Like it was like, there was just so much in common. Yeah. Oh, look, and you wear black shoes. Wow, let's have a call, right? Well, I could keep going, but we've gone way over time. I so appreciate the time. Oh, Where can people find you? In Atlanta, but more more directly. Uh, I have a website, bulletproofyourcareer.com. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn. And if you do want to attend every single uh, Thursday night for free, I do a workshop and then I open it to Q&A. And last night we had 578 people on the call. And we have been doing that every single week, as I said, from August of 2018. And we have 570 something almost every week. 
Amazing. Um, and then that community is so people are trading information and sharing. It's, it is so robust. And we have a private LinkedIn group. So I would please reach out to me. Just mention that we were in the huddle and I'll make sure that I get you connected right away. And then I'll invite you into that. But I'd love to have you in that. It's just a really, it's just a wonderful community. And there's all levels and all industries in there. And then my website and LinkedIn. Awesome. Amazing. And I highly encourage you all to read Pat's book. All right. Pat Romaletti, thank you so much for being with us. 